with National Skills Coalition. And thanks to those of you on the East Coast where it actually is afternoon, but also good morning to those of you on the West Coast and other parts of the country where we're still in the morning time. You are joining a webinar on understanding the immigration public charge proposal, implications in particular for adult education and workforce advocates. Just a couple of quick housekeeping details before we get started. Um, following today's webinar, tomorrow you will get an email with a link to the recording of the webinar and the slides. So no need to take notes or um, sort of hustle to get down information. You will have that to be able to access starting tomorrow. We'll also put a link on the webinars page of the National Skills Coalition website. Uh, so you can click on the recording and the slides from that link as well. During today's webinar, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. Um, if they are sort of quick clarifying questions, we may address them as, your, um, as, as the presenters proceed. Um, but for more substantive ones, we will save them for the Q&A portion at the end of today's webinar. Again, um, I'm Amanda Bergson Choka and um, I am the Director of Upskilling Policy here at National Skills Coalition. Um, I imagine that most of you are joining because you have some uh, beginning background in the, in the public charge issue, but the way we've designed today's webinar is really to talk through what's at stake, um, give you an overview of the public charge proposal, what it means for skills advocates, um, and then tell you how you can take action. So the public charge issue, it's a new proposed regulation from the Trump administration, and you'll hear us refer to it today as an NPRM, that's a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Um, and that is something, making sure that the screen share is working here so that everybody can see the slides. Um, one second, I'm getting some feedback that perhaps folks may not be seeing slides. We'll go back and just verify that folks are able to uh, share here. Um, okay. so go back in here to screen share and make sure that everybody can see. All right. So hopefully Folks can see proposal now as we get going. Okay. Um, so, okay. So this is the opening slide. Hopefully, you got to see the slide uh, with me, and then um, uh, the what's at stake slide. What are the proposed uh, regulations? Um, and uh, sort of, what are the implications for? immigrants in uh, participating in adult education and workforce programs. So the concern here, and apologies for the minor technical difficulties there, the concern here is that this proposed regulation could have impacts on whether immigrants enroll in or are staying up as participants in a wide variety of adult education and workforce programs, even though the regulation doesn't directly target those programs. And we're going to go through what that actually means uh, as we get deeper into this. But the concern for skills advocates, for service providers in particular, is that enrollment and student retention or uh, job seeker retention and success, success rates could drop um, as a result of this proposed regulation, even if the regulation never actually takes effect because of the widespread chilling effect that we are concerned about. There are steps you can take, and in particular, submitting public comments to help policymakers understand how this regulation would undercut skills policy goals is really important. Um, you may have seen in a lot of the news coverage around this that there are some fabulous advocates doing work on a wide range of issues related to public charge, everything from child nutrition to public health. Our focus today is really narrowly on the workforce, adult education, and higher education implications of this proposal. So we're going to talk first about what the public charge regulation is, 
um, and I'll be introducing my co-presenter in just a minute, who's going to be leading us through that. Then I'll come back and we'll walk through uh, some implications of what the proposed regulation actually means for adult education and workforce advocates. Then we'll talk through the specifics of how you can take action. National Skills Coalition has written some template comments, and you're welcome to use that template as the basis for your own comments. Um, and as a reminder, uh, comments can be submitted by individuals or organizations. And so if your organization is not yet in a position to submit comments on this issue, your comments as an individual are also quite powerful. And then finally, we do have a good chunk of time at the end of today's webinar for your questions. I am joined today uh, by the fabulous Gabrielle Lassard, who is a senior policy attorney at the National Immigration Law Center. There's a couple of slides at the end of this presentation that tell you more about the nonprofit NILK, as it's known. Uh, but if you follow Immigration News at all, you know that NILK advocates for low-income immigrants in a wide range of spheres. And Gabrielle has a, a deep background in public benefits issues um, and has really been a terrific partner for us excuse me, and for the field more generally on issues related to public charge. So Gabrielle, we're delighted to have you with us here today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slides for you. So as you're ready to go to the next one, you can just say next slide. Okay, let's go. Next slide, Amanda. Okay. All right, so as a good lawyer, I have to start with disclaimers. So in, for about the last almost two years, we've been in an environment where things in the immigration realm are constantly changing. So there's just a lot that we don't know. Um, we do have much more concrete information than we did two weeks ago since the proposed rule has been published. But we are sharing information that we have at this time, which could change. And as always, we're providing general information and not legal advice. Next slide. Okay. So just to provide some background, public charge is actually a very old part of immigration law that in some form dates back to the colonial period. And throughout that time, the meaning of public charge has been a person who's dependent on the government for financial and material support. Under current immigration law, the likelihood that a person will become a public charge is assessed at two points in their immigration journey. One is when they apply to enter the United States, um, for admission to the United States. So that can actually happen in the country as well as abroad, but it's typically abroad. And then the second is when they apply to become a law, lawful permanent resident, um, which we call LPR, also known as a green card holder. Things that people ask us frequently are whether somebody will be assessed for public charge when they apply to become a citizen or when they apply for a renewal of their permanent resident card or green card. And the answer to both of those is no. That once the person has become a permanent resident, unless they leave the United States for a continuous period of more than six months, which would cause them to be assessed for all the grounds of admissibility when they return, they will not be reassessed for uh, the likelihood that they'll become a public charge. Next slide. Amanda? Sorry about that. My screen is sticking for a minute. I'm just going to go to, there we go. Okay, so I, I covered that. Next slide, please. Okay, um, also really important to know that not everyone is subject to public charge. There are many categories of people who are admitted to the United States for humanitarian reasons who don't go through a public charge assessment. And those include refugees, people applying for or granted asylum, people who are survivors of human trafficking who are applying for or have been granted a T visa, people who are survivors of serious crimes who are applying for or have been granted a U visa, people who are petitioning to adjust their own status under certain provisions of the Violence Against Women Act, and special immigrant juveniles, which are children who have been abandoned by their parents or have been abused in a way that they are deemed to be abandoned. Next slide. So it, one thing that's really important to know as we talk about public charge is that it's a subjective assessment the immigration official or consular officer is looking at whether a person is likely to become a public charge at any time in the future. 
it's made by looking at the totality of circumstances, which means all of the facts that are relevant to the determination of whether the person will become dependent on the government at some time. Next slide. So again, the public charge assessment looks at all of the factors of the totality of circumstances test. By statute, immigration officers are required to consider five factors, which are the individual's age, their health, what kind of income and financial resources they have, how many dependents they're supporting, and what kind of education skills and work experience they have. The statute provides that other relevant factors may also be considered, but the only other relevant factor that it mentions specifically is whether the person has an adequate affidavit of support that has been executed by a sponsor on their behalf. And that's basically just the sponsor's commitment to support the immigrant. Um, notice that none of this has anything to do with public benefits, even though when we think about public charge in the United States, our focus is generally on the benefits that people use. Next slide, please. So following welfare reform in 1996, there was a lot of overreaching and uncertainty connected to public charge. And in 1999, following a huge advocacy effort, the Clinton administration put out guidance that said only two public benefits can be considered in analyzing whether someone is likely to become a public charge. And being dependent on either of those benefits is the definition of being a public charge. And those two benefits are cash assistance for income maintenance. So that's generally TANF, SSI. Um, if people have a state program, for example, in California, we have a program called CAPI that's a cash assistance program for certain immigrants, county general relief, any cash grant that the person is intended to use as income support would count. Special purpose, short-term cash, um, you know, cash for child assistance or, or for child care or um, energy assistance, any other sorts of cash are not counted for public charge purposes. The second is institutionalization for long-term care at government expense, and that is generally a person being in the nursing in a nursing home that's being paid for by Medicaid. This is actually still the current public charge test and will remain so until the proposed regulations become effective. Um, so we are seeing in the community that people have been dropping benefits now in anticipation of the new rule. And we're really discouraging that because the, the current standard remains in effect and people will have time to transition off of benefits if that's the right choice for their family once the new rule becomes effective. Next slide. Okay, so what are the proposed changes? Next slide, please. So first of all, the proposed rule would broaden the groups of people who are subject to a public charge assessment in the United States. So it would, they would extend the public charge assessment to two new categories of, of, of non-immigrants, actually. So people who are in the United States with non-immigrant visas, um, student visa, H-1B, H-2A, you know, basically student or employment related visas that can be extended. When people go to extend those visas, they will be subject to a public charge assessment. People who have non-immigrant visas who are applying to change the category of their non-immigrant visa, for example, from a student visa to an employment-based visa, will also be subject to a public charge assessment. Next slide. It also would change the definition of a public charge to a person who uses or receives one or more public benefits that are addressed within the rule. This is such a seismic shift. It's really, it's difficult to overstate the significance of it because we're going from a definition that has been in use for over a hundred years to of a person being completely dependent on the government to someone just using a benefit, which in many cases is going to be a supplement to employment. Um, the regulations would also expand the factors considered in the public charge analysis, uh, primarily on the, in a negative way. So the use of certain healthcare, food, and housing benefits would now be considered as negative factors. And immigration agents would also be directed to look at a number of additional factors, including 
person's English proficiency, whether they have health insurance, their credit score, and numerous other factors. Next slide, please. So the benefits that would be added under the new rule or the proposed rule would be, in addition to cash and long-term care, Medicaid with exceptions for emergency, med emergency services and services that are provided to children in schools, primarily through the Individual with Disabilities and Education Act, SNAP, formerly called food stamps, Section 8, and that's both project-based assist assistance and individual Section 8 vouchers, as well as public housing, and financial assistance under Medicare Part D, which is the prescription pro drug portion of the Medicare program, which primarily serves seniors who have credit for 40 quarters of work in the United States. Next slide, please. So everything that's not listed would not be counted in the public charge test. If people have been following this closely, you're aware that in previous drafts that were leaked in the press, there was a catch-all category for other benefits that were within a definition provided but not listed in the rule. That's gone. We now have certainty about which benefits are likely to be considered. Um, I say likely because the regulation poses the question of whether CHIP should also be considered as a negative factor. That's the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is a healthcare program available to children in families that earn too much money to receive Medicaid. So everything not specifically listed is included. That includes Social Security retirement benefits as well as anything else that people get because of their work or the quarters of work that they've accumulated, unemployment, workers' compensation, Medicare, um, with that one exception, as well as workers' compensation, non-cash benefits that provide for education, child development, employment and job training. So your programs would not be directly affected. Um, and then other kinds of education benefits, in-state tuition, Pell Grants, and then any local, state, or tribal public benefit that is not cash assistance for income maintenance or institutionalization for long-term care at government expense. So for example, um, to come back to a California, well, I can say n there are six states that provide health coverage for children regardless of their immigration status using state funds. That state-funded health program would not be considered as a negative in the public charge assessment. The same is true in states that provide food assistance for people who are ineligible for federal SNAP because they're in a five-year bar or otherwise don't have an immigration status that makes them eligible for SNAP. Even though it looks like SNAP, that kind of a state-funded non-cash benefit would not be a negative factor. Another factor is that's excluded is benefits that are used by persons other than the applicant. In some of the earlier drafts, we had seen um, a proposal that benefits that were used by the intending immigrants' dependents would also count against them. That is gone. So now it's only benefits that are used by the person that are going to be considered as a negative in their public charge test. Next slide, please. Okay, again, repeating, school lunch is exempt, um, that benefits used by members of the immigrant's household will not be counted against them. Next slide. Okay, other changes. Um, I think this is unprecedented, except you know, possibly within the, the world of investor visas, that the proposed rules would also incorporate income thresholds. So in looking at the, the household's financial resources, it would actually, the, the proposed rule would make it a negative factor if the immigrant did not earn at least 125% of the federal poverty level. That's about $31,000 for a family of four. It's a low income, but we're talking about people who are potentially coming from very poor countries. Um, and it, it's not a threshold that's, that's mandated or otherwise reflected in the statute. It would also add heavily weighted factors. There's six heavily weighted factors, five are negative. The only positive one would be that the household had an income of at least 
250% of the federal poverty level, which is just under $63,000 for a family of four and is actually higher than the U.S. median income. Next slide. So as I said, the rule would add heavily weighted, the proposed rule would add heavily weighted factors. So the negative factors would be that the person had work authorization or employment authorization, but wasn't working and wasn't a full-time student, that they were currently receiving a public benefit or had used a public benefit within the last 36 months. That's not every public benefit. It's the public benefits that would be considered as negatives under this rule. Um, one of the questions that comes up frequently is whether the 36-month look back will enable immigration officials to consider benefits that people used before the effective date of the rule. It's pretty clear that the rule will not be retroactive so that they, the immigration officials will not be able to look back a full three years until three years after the rule's effective date. They will also consider whether a person has, a med has been diagnosed with a medical condition that could interfere with their ability to work, study, or care for themselves, or that would require expensive treatment or institutionalization down the line. Um, I can think of a number of medical conditions, including you know, very common ones like diabetes, where you could project that at some point the person would have it would cause the person to have difficulty working. But it's such an unknown at the time that they're applying for it for an immigration status. Um, also would take into consideration as a heavily weighted negative factor whether the person is uninsured and does not have the prospect of receiving private insurance or the resources that would enable them to pay out of pocket for care and whether they were previously determined to be a public charge which in my opinion is completely unworkable because public charge is based upon a totality of factors that are constantly changing. The fact that a person was assessed to be likely, was deemed likely to become a public charge while they were in graduate school does not mean that they are going to be a public charge now that they have graduated and are working. Um, so that's my editorial comment about that one. Next slide. Okay, again, really important for community members to understand that the proposed rule is not retroactive. Only the existing benefits, cash assistance and long-term care can be considered until after the rule becomes final, plus an additional 60 days. So it's a little hard to communicate that verbally, so I've created a chart um, to show that there'll be 60 days after the rule becomes final before the new benefits will be considered. Next slide. All right, here's a person. Next slide. All right, and now <laughs> okay. we transition to Amanda. And that's our Thanks transition. Just, just as a reminder for the fact that uh, while we heard a lot of really in-depth and important information from Gabrielle there, um, these issues are important because they do affect the people that we work with every day, and that's why I have the person slide here. Okay. So you've gotten a very quick uh, but detailed thumbnail from Gabrielle about um, these issues in general. What I'm going to do now is talk about what these issues mean for workforce and adult education and higher education advocates in particular. Um, so the first and most important consequence and potential risk is the chilling effect. Right. There have been numerous news stories and excellent data from a wide range of sources, including nonprofit organizations as well as government agencies, that immigrants are already calling up to disenroll themselves from a wide variety of publicly funded programs just to be on the safe side, even though the regulations have not been finalized, even though, as Gabrielle just said, there's not going to be a look back where um, you know, they would be looking at benefits that people use now. And even though there's a lot of benefits that people are disenrolling themselves from um, that are not counted in, would not be counted in the public benefits assessment. Um, so that's the first concern, right, is that folks may disenroll themselves from adult education or workforce programs just because they're afraid that participating in a publicly funded program might jeopardize their immigration status. Um, so there will be, uh, you know, a really important role for a lot of National Skills Coalition members in making sure that your frontline staff have accurate information so that you can reassure 
job seekers and workers and participants in your workforce and education programs, that participating in those programs is not going to jeopardize. Um, however, given how complicated the new rules are, and to be honest, Gabrielle and I went back and forth on this and we didn't even include some of the layers of complexity like how they're going to calculate how many months of receiving benefits count against you or what dollar amount things need to be in order to count. Um, it, we're moving from a clear bright line standard to a much more complicated standard and that makes it harder for you to put a sentence on your enrollment form or on an opening computer screen that sort of says um, don't worry this will you know this will not affect your your immigration status. Now Certainly for things like um, uh, participating in an ESL class, um, you know, that will not jeopardize somebody's status. But I know that there are National Skills Coalition members that are providing um, uh, a wide range of supportive services and perhaps things like access to SNAP um, or help enrolling in SNAP or, or Medicaid. And so um, if that is the case for your organization, that will be an additional challenge. Um, the other big challenge around the chilling effect is, unfortunately, the role of sort of rumors and misinformation and misunderstood or misinterpreted um, information. There's been a huge amount of news coverage around public charge. Um, most of it has been broadly accurate. Some parts of it have been less accurate and some parts of it have been outright wrong. Um, and so it can be a bit challenging uh, when people have heard or seen something on the news and they are reacting in response to that and your organization um, may have accurate information about the public benefits and the public charge uh, proposal, but you may have constituents or, who are sort of reacting to things that they've heard um, in other contexts. So the, the next um, area that's particularly important for skills advocates to be aware of is that we really are moving from a clear bright line standard that said, are you getting more than 50% of your income from cash welfare, SSI? Are you full-time institutionalized? If not, then those factors, you know, those are the public benefits that would count against you. Now we're moving into this much more complex and multifaceted set of um, factors and, and issues that are going to be weighed in a really subjective way, as, as Gabrielle said. So there isn't a sort of one sentence message that we can give you today um, that you can share with the participants and constituents in your program. And I'm emphasizing this for two reasons. One, um, this is something that it's going to be really important to mention in your comments to the federal government on this proposal, right? What is the cost to your organization of having to go from a simple, straightforward, you know, one sentence disclaimer to this much more nuanced and complicated set of variables and if this, then that, and in this case, you may want to take that into account. Um, those are, are issues that will have costs for you as an organization and that needs to be made clear if you are submitting comments to the federal government. Um, it's also the case that this regulation, if it's enacted, would create some really difficult choices for a lot of adult learners and job seekers, right? So there are factors that the uh, federal government is proposing to count as positive considerations. Are your English skills strong? What's your level of educational attainment? Are you currently working? And yet, there are steps that people take, like depending on SNAP while they're in the middle of a training program or using Medicaid to make sure that they have health care coverage when they're finishing an adult education program if they're not working or if their employer perhaps doesn't offer health coverage. Um, and so people are, are going to be forced in a situation where they're going to be making difficult choices about, well, if I withdraw from SNAP or Medicaid because I'm concerned about the immigration consequences of that, would that jeopardize my ability to continue my job training program or my education program because I need those nutrition benefits or I need those health benefits in order to be able to maintain my participation? Um, again, something that particularly for those of you who are in multi-service agencies, um, those are the kind of choices that your constituents and your clients are weighing every day. This is just adding a lot of complexity to that process. And then there are going to be new costs, 
right? So there's this issue of staff training on the new regulation. Um, even if you are an organization that doesn't have anything to do with providing legal advice or legal services, you are going to need to make sure that your guidance counselors, your financial aid counselors, your career navigators, your frontline uh, social workers or ESL teachers or others at least have a couple of key uh, sort of talking points and an overview of this regulation in order to be able to get accurate information out to your constituents, um, both for the good of the individual constituents, but also to prevent people, as mentioned, from sort of disenrolling from programs or stepping away from publicly funded education and workforce services out of fear or confusion. And then depending on your organization, whether you're a community college or a workforce board or another type of provider, you may actually have to invest in the redesign of enrollment forms or computer systems um, that currently either allow people to do joint enrollment, like maybe they, it allows uh, folks to sign up for SNAP uh, while they're also enrolling in a job training program or uh, screens people for Medicaid at the same time as it's screening them for other kinds of employment or, or education services. Many times, uh, states and localities and other entities have had sort of a one-sentence disclaimer um, on the screen, on the enrollment screen of these systems, we're about to get into a much more complicated world here. And so these kinds of uh, consequences are a burden. They are, they are a regulatory burden. And frankly, they are not contemplated in the uh, draft regulations. The federal government spelled out um, what they see as some of the costs of implementing this regulation, and they have a brief mention that there will be regulatory familiarization costs. That is, um, somebody needs to read the rule and understand what it means for their organization. But there's really no acknowledgement that even if one person in your organization reads that rule, you're still gonna have to provide training to your frontline staff, professional development, if you have staff providing uh, guidance, particularly around things like financial aid in the higher education realm and so forth. Um, and there's certainly no acknowledgement of the costs around forms and, and IT systems. So that's something that we think is really important for the federal government to hear from loud and clear if that is something that is affecting your organization. Um, and then the, the last area that we're really concerned about for skills advocates in particular is around confusion on braided funding. We've started to get a number of these questions from National Skills Coalition members already. Um, public charge obviously measures benefits that are given to individual immigrants, so not benefits or funding that is given to institutions. So let's say you're a community college and you are braiding some TANF or some SNAP money in with Pell Grant money and tuition money and state funding for higher education to fund a class uh, or a job training program, that will not jeopardize your immigrant student's ability to um, apply for a green card or, or change their status. However, um, we know that it's complicated and we know that you may be getting questions from your coworkers or your higher ups or um, others in your institution about this because people will see that SNAP and TANF get mentioned and then they'll be concerned that somehow that could affect their institution. So again, we expect there to be sort of a, an administrative burden on those institutions as they kind of uh, have their in-house legal counsel read through this and understand where the variables may affect them and their students and where they aren't. Um, so that's a quick tour of how we see public charge particularly having effects on adult education and workforce advocates. Now, we don't just want to discourage you by talking about why this proposal is problematic in all of these, uh, all of these many ways. We want to give you some real tools to take action. Uh, the most important thing you can do is to submit a public comment to the federal government about this regulation opposing it in your own words, right? Um, Gabrielle has put together this really nice timeline here, right? So the NPRM is the proposed rule that we're talking about. Um, it has been published in the Federal Register. We are now in the middle step, step three here, where it was highlighted in blue, which is the opportunity for public comments. 
um, and this lasts for 60 days. The deadline is December 10th. Uh, following that confidence period, the agency, which in this case is the Department of Homeland Security, um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services is the agency within that, um, they must read and respond to the comments they're receiving. And then um, if they decide to move forward with the rule, then they will publish the final rule. Um, so we strongly recommend that you submit a public comment. Um, as mentioned, you can do this as an individual if it's not something that your organization is in a position to do, or you can do it as an organization. Uh, we do not encourage people having a sign-on letter. Uh, this is something where individual comments are much more important. That is to say, if there are five community colleges or five local workforce boards, it is much more effective if you each submit your own comment rather than all signing on to the same set of comments. Um, we understand that you're all busy people and that this is a really complicated issue. So National Skills Coalition has drafted a set of template comments which are available as a Word document. Um, they are linked in the slide here, but you can also access them if you go to the front page of the National Skills Coalition website um, and you look at our blog post, you'll see that there's an October 12th blog post linked at the very front page of our website on public charge. Um, and the template comments are linked um, in that blog post as well. So you can just download the Word document right now if you wanna do that. Um, we recommend that you modify our template with information that is specific to your organization or your set of circumstances. In particular, we've put a little set of economic calculations. Um, and I'm just gonna sort of walk through how we uh, chose to, to suggest one of those just to give you a sense of them, right? So let's imagine that your organization is a provider of adult education services. And let's imagine that you have um, one person on staff whose responsibility it is amidst a number of other responsibilities to pay attention to policy developments. And then you have 10 teachers or case managers who are sort of frontline staff working with your learners. It might be the case that you would need to have, let's say, four hours of your professional staff person's time to read the regulation summary from National Skills Coalition and, and NILC and, um, and develop your internal organizational sort of position on this. Um, and then let's say that professional person had to spend an hour training all 10 of your staff on this. Um, so if the hourly rate for your professional staff person is, let's say, $30 an hour. Um, you can calculate out, okay, four hours of that person's time at $30 an hour would be X amount of money. If the hourly rate for your ESL teachers is 12 or 15 or $20 an hour, whatever that might be, um, you calculate that out. The important thing to keep in mind here is this isn't about cash that your organization is writing a check on. This is about time, your employees' time, which costs money because you're paying them during the time that they participate in professional development or staff training. And you could be using that time for something else if you didn't have to spend it doing this public comment work. So including those economic calculations is really important. And we've put in uh, a set of yellow highlighted sections in the template comments that will allow you to sort of plug in those numbers and, and do the calculations in a really straightforward way um, so that this is not a time consuming uh, process for you. The last point I'll say is, you know, as you read through the template comments, you may find that there are some that don't apply to your organization. Feel free not to use those paragraphs, right? We've, we've bracketed out each separate argument in its own point. You can copy paste the ones that apply and don't use the ones that don't, but do include some original language and it can be as plain and simple as you like. It doesn't have to be fancy or elegant um, because the more unique comments there are, uh, the better from a, a regulatory perspective. And in particular, um, we're encouraging folks to try to have about a third of whatever comments they submit be in their own words and two thirds be copy pasted or adapted from the template that National Skills Coalition is providing. Once you have your comments ready, you can submit them on regulations.gov. Again, the deadline is December 10th. 
We would love it if you would email a copy of your comments to National Skills Coalition. There's oftentimes a bit of a lag between the time when you submit your comment and the time when the federal government actually posts it publicly. And so if you send your comments, we'll know that you submitted them, even if they haven't already been posted publicly. Um, so we strongly encourage you to do that. Our argument is that the federal government should withdraw the proposed changes and go back to the existing standard, which was a clear, bright line standard uh, that really has been in effect for decades and is one that wouldn't undercut the investments in skills. So that takes us to the end of the formal part of our uh, presentation here. We now have some time for questions, so I'm going to encourage you um, in terms of uh, uh, using our, our chat, uh, sorry, our Q&A box, um, excuse me, okay. to submit your, questions, uh, submit your questions there. Um, so the first question, uh, Gabrielle, is around uh, what's called BFET. What about the basic food employment training program to access this employment training funding? Students must be receiving federal basic food. How many immigrants will lose access? So I think there's two parts to this question. One, um, that is a state-specific name for the SNAP Employment and Training Program. So this is really a question about SNAP. Um, and so the first part of the question for you, Gabrielle, is um, would uh, participating in the state version of SNAP, given that, that individuals have to be receiving federal SNAP to participate in the state program, uh, would that count against people? Seems like a pretty straightforward yes, no question. Mm -hmm. um, but then the second question is how many immigrants could lose access? And there I think it gets a bit more complicated because we know that some of the people who are currently receiving SNAP um, are refugees and asylees and they are not subject to the public charge rules. So can you talk a little bit on both those questions? Um, so again, if, if a benefit is tied to the receipt of another of a benefit that is considered a negative then the person you know it, the receipt of the underlying benefit would be considered a negative um, so another example of that is that services medicaid funded services delivered to children in schools are exempted but in order to for the schools to get reimbursed through medicaid for those services the families have to be enrolled in medicaid and the problem is primarily one that the families are going to be deterred from enrolling in the programs. And because these rules are complicated and people don't understand them well, even though people are exempt from the rule or they may, um, you know, already be a permanent resident, the deterrent effect goes far beyond the people that would actually be undergoing the public charge assessment. So it's really, it's hard to calculate the number of people that would be affected other than looking at the number of households receiving the benefits that have an immigrant household member and anticipating that some percentage of them are going to be deterred from accessing that benefit. And there was actually a prior question that came in, um, which was, what about a household where the family is getting a child-only TANF grant? And would that be counted against the parent? And it really depends on whether the parent has another income source. Under the current public charge assessment, if the family's only source of income is a child-only TANF grant or other kind of child-only cash grant, then that cash is considered to be the, the parent's primary income source. So that would be the one situation where another family member's use of a benefit could be considered as a negative. Great, thank you for those points, Gabrielle. Um, so there's a question here about, you know, what is the value of copy-pasting comments? What Would they just count as one comment? I wanna go back to this because we did mention it before. We are recommending that people use about two-thirds of copy-pasted comment and about one-third of original comment in whatever comment they submit. And again, I wouldn't overthink it. I would encourage people to write simply in their own words. Um, and it can be really helpful if you just click on the regulations.gov link. You can see that some of the thousands and thousands of comments that have already been submitted. There have been about 25,000 submitted so far, and I think about 5,000 of them are publicly viewable. 
even if you just look at the first page and the first eight or 10 comments, you can see the kind of plain English responses that people have submitted. And I think that can be reassuring if you're trying to do an email out to your stakeholders to encourage them to submit a comment and you think they might get sort of paralyzed by, I don't have time to sit down and write a really thoughtful, well-developed set of comments. How can I do this? Um, showing them a couple of examples of the kind of real world comments that are coming in can be can be reassuring. Um, yeah, and one thing that I that I've noticed in looking at the comments is apparently some group is asking people to start with how the comments or how the proposed regulations make them feel. And that has really resulted in a lot of varied comments. Um, Conversely, groups like ours that have a template comment that's posted that we're asking people to personalize but they don't always do are being grouped as mass mail campaigns, which you can see by searching mass mail on the regulations.gov docket. And we've, as of last night, out of the 25,000 or so comments that had been submitted, about 7,000 came through us and were being counted as mass mail. So I can't overemphasize the importance of customizing your comment. Thank you, Gabrielle. That's really important. And again, National Skills Coalition put the economic impact calculation part at the top of our template comments just to make clear that you can make that sort of customized to your specific organization pretty easily. Um, and that is part of helping differentiate your comments. Um, Okay, so we have some more questions. One around industries that may be affected. So the question is, our region has a construction industry that's booming, that's composed of a majority of immigrant employees that work full time. In general, would these employees see this rule as jeopardizing their employment or being in this country? Would the horse racing industry be affected? I think the big takeaway from this question is that there are many industries in this country, and you've named a couple of them, that have a significant proportion of immigrants in their workforce. And any kind of federal policy proposal that would dramatically reshape the immigration process is going to have ripple effects on those workers. Um, now, if those workers are uh, currently undocumented, this rule is not directly targeting them because it really is targeted at people who are currently have status and are either trying to extend or change that status or applying for a green card. And I'm oversimplifying a little bit here, but um, it's really important to recognize that potential universe of people affected by this is millions of people. So we're not talking about a small fraction of the immigrant workforce in this country. And I think um, it, it's important to recognize that and to, to acknowledge that whatever the industries may be in your particular region of the country, um, the odds are significant that it's going to be affected by this proposal. So Gabrielle, a question for you here with regard to what happens if somebody's in the process of applying for a change in status, right? So maybe they've filed their green card application and then suddenly circumstances change and they need to apply for benefits to survive, right? So I'm imagining perhaps somebody gets laid off from their job and now they need to apply for SNAP, right? Will this be held against them? So do we know the answer to that at this point? I don't think we really know. Um I'm going to answer, I'm going to say we don't really know a different issue, which is we don't know what's going to happen to pending app, to applications that are pending at the time that the regulation becomes effective. We don't know if, if once they, if they've been submitted before the effective date, they'll be processed under the existing rules or if the new rules will be applied to them. Um, and I don't think we will know that before the rule actually goes into effect. In terms of somebody who is in the process of adjusting their status and then they need benefits, it is a heavily weighted negative factor if the person is currently receiving benefits. So, um, but the immigration official is supposed to take that into consideration in conjunction with all of the other factors so that if that person has had a good work history, is educated, English proficient, you know, has a good credit score, um, then that combination of factors could outweigh the benefit use. 
Great. Okay. Now we have a question here around if you are a high-skilled foreign educated immigrant who has relied on some means-tested funding that is in jeopardy, but you have a green card or some other form of permanent legal status, are you still at risk? I will answer the first part of this and then turn it over to Gabrielle for the second part. The first thing is there's only two kinds of permanent status that an immigrant can have. One is that they have naturalized and become a U.S. citizen, in which case this issue would not apply to them directly. Um, or that they have a green card, in which case the only reason that a public charge uh, assessment would be applied against them is if they left the United States for longer than six months and then they came back to the United States. And when you come back after being gone for more than six months, you are essentially applying for admission again. And so they would apply the public charge test as part of the general uh, admissions process. Gabrielle, can you sort of elaborate on that um, to, to more fully answer this person's question? Well, again, I, you know, I think what you said is the answer, that it, once you've gotten LPR status, unless you leave the country for more than six months, you won't be assessed again. Um, and if a person is high-skilled and foreign, foreign, well, it doesn't matter if they're foreign educated, but a person who's high-skilled, um, you know, looks like they are likely to earn a good income in the United States, those factors would help to overcome any negative inference um, based on using benefits in the past. That's great. Um, so really important question here. Somebody's asking what kind of retraining would service providers and university staff receive to ensure accurate advice for giving for immigrant adult learners? So the short answer is this is an unfunded federal mandate coming down from the federal government. There is no provision in this regulation for training or educating uh, service providers or university staff on this issue. So what that means is the burden will fall on your institution, on your state associations, perhaps on your state agencies, perhaps on nonprofit stakeholders to provide that kind of training. And that is exactly the kind of thing that we're looking for in the public comments on this issue, which is to emphasize, look, we're in the business of helping people get trained for jobs that employers need filled in our community. Distracting us with having to send staff off for additional training, having to pay money for additional training for staff is undercutting our ability to be able to invest in the workforce training that employers in our community are saying they badly need, right? And so um, essentially this regulation is, is, as I said, an unfunded mandate. And so being clear about that in your comments is, is really, really important. Um, and and re reaching out to your, pro your professional associations is, is also important. Gabrielle, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I just want to add a reminder that we don't want people giving immigration advice um, you know, unless they are immigration lawyers. So I think that we are going to need, and we, I mean, we NILC, um, are going to need to put together resources for people to refer to or even hand out um, so that they are, you know, clearly delineating between what facts that we know and things that people would really need to get advice to determine. That is very important reminder. Um, you know, I am not a lawyer. I cannot provide legal advice. That is a very important sentence for all of your staff to know um, and, and, a, and a really important reminder. We have one more question waiting to be answered. I just want to encourage folks, if you have anything we haven't yet addressed, this is the moment to put it in the Q&A box before we wrap up here. Um, so the last question is regarding organizations that are relying on graded funding that combines uh, means-tested and non-means-tested public funds in their adult education program, how can they best transition to ensure the safest funding strategy? So the first thing is, I would not ever suggest that an institution step away from receiving funding. And in particular, on this question of public benefits, even if your institution is getting SNAP or TANF money to serve a group of participants, remember, that would not count against your participants, even if they're subject to the public charge. Only benefits that they receive as individuals would count against them. So even if they're enrolled in a job training program at your organization that's paid for in part out of SNAP or TANF money, that is not going to jeopardize them. It is whether they are themselves 
uh, SNAP recipients or have applied for SNAP or, um, or TANF recipients or whether they've applied for TANF um, that would affect their immigration status. Anything you want to add to that point, Gabrielle? No. All right. Um, well, we are coming to the end of our time here today. Um, Gabrielle, I just want to thank you and Nilk for your partnership on this work and remind everyone that um, there are a wealth of resources out there. Um, in addition to the ones that I've shared, Nilk has shared a number of different resources related to public charge. They're on the final slide here that I'm showing you now. Uh, and you'll be able to access this again when you get the um, slides in your email tomorrow, um, as well as some additional background information about MILK. Um, if you do submit a public comment, please email it to me, as well as submitting it at regulations.gov. You can see my email address here on the screen. And if you haven't already, we encourage you to visit the National Skills Coalition website and sign up for our email list. Thank you all so much for participating. Sorry, Gabrielle. One more website, um, protectingimmigrantfamilies.org is our campaign website where people can sign their organizations up to be active members of our national campaign related to public charge and get lots of resources. Great. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day.